Good morning. I'm Pastor Trevor, our teaching pastor here at Coastal. Excited to be with you this morning. And uh, a quick thing you may not know about me, but back during COVID, I tried and failed to become some kind of skilled woodworker. Um, I think back during COVID, a lot of us, we needed a hobby. We had some extra time and uh, that was the pathway that I went down. And and really for me, I learned the most from social media. I, I was following all sorts of different people. I was following these, these guys that were doing all sorts of crazy woodworking, and I followed a lot of the beginners, a lot of the beginner groups. I, I followed them as well, trying to learn their tricks, learn more about wood and how it's supposed to go, and it, it, it didn't turn out very well. Um, but uh, I, I think a lot of it was because I ended up hearing about the history that they had. These guys have been doing it, many of them, for like decades and decades, and I was trying to accomplish it, you know, a weekend here and there over a couple months, and it just didn't really work out too well. But I tell you, even though I didn't become an expert, I really did enjoy going deeper. I I enjoyed as I followed these guys, seeing more about what they were doing and and, and the ideas and the things that they had to teach me and then going out and miserably failing at trying to do it myself. As we're continuing in our follow series this morning, I love what Pastor Brian's been sharing the past couple weeks, that it's more than just believing. Jesus calls us to follow. And he wants us kind of like me and and those guys on social media to to go deeper, to better understand who he is, and then to go out and try and apply it to our lives. And so this week, we're going to talk about learn to heal. In the past couple weeks, we've had kind of a similar, uh, I I don't know, subtlety maybe that's been in each of our sermons. We've had learn to be with Jesus. Then last week, we had learn to listen. And then this week is now learn to heal. And in each one of those, if you pick up on it, it, it's not like a box that you check. It's not a, a something that you just fill out a card or make a decision or pray a prayer and it's, it's done in your life. Instead, all of them are a, pro, a progression, a, a process that we go to, more of the pathway to get on as compared to the destination to reach. And this really kind of makes sense when we talk about healing. Uh, any kind of injury, it really takes time in order to, to heal up from it. And, and I don't mind telling you, as I've gotten a little bit older... I noticed that the injuries that I used to just like get over real quick with a good night's sleep, they linger. (laughs) Sadly, some of those injuries are waking up sore from sleeping. That one I've still not figured out. Um, But days later, I'm still like, what in the, oh, right, right. I slept on my side last night or last week. But whenever we talk about healing, not just with uh, joints and muscles and so forth, But even with, you know, cuts and surgeries, you know, stitches, when they're healing, they they even itch, which is weirdly like a good sign that you're, you're making progress. Then we, then we take it to something else. We take it to those hurts that we have, those things that have been said to us, those, those things that have been done to us, that they leave a different kind of mark, a different kind of, a different kind of scar that it takes time to get over. It's not like we can just say, oh, well, forgiven and forgotten and move past it. Sometimes, sometimes maybe, but a lot of times that's not the case. Anybody remember the, the, the old show Bewitched? Yeah, okay. She could wiggle her nose and fix it. You know, it'd be nice if we could wiggle our, our nose and fix it, but we can't. It's, it's just not in our control. And so today we're going to kind of focus on some things that are outside our control. And, and, and some of those things that are what is within our control and some of the limits that we, that we need to avoid within what we can do and what we can control. That seemed really clear, didn't it? So we're going to talk about the limits that we need to avoid with what we can do. So let's go to Mark chapter 2. That's going to be a lot clearer than Trevor, I'm sure. All right, starting in verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that, they had, that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, a few connections that we want to make here before we go any further. Um, The same story that we're hearing in Mark chapter 2 is the same story that Matthew chapter 9 tells. Just different gospel story, a little bit different view of it, but it's the same thing. So to understand what's been going on with Jesus, the Matthew, uh, the verses and chapters in Matthew kind of give us a little bit more detail. Uh, We have the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus had just done where he's preached to thousands. But more importantly, in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus does all sorts of healing. 
He heals the sick over and over and over again. There, there's a leper. For those of you that don't know what leprosy is, it's where there's a, a, something that happens to your nerves where you suddenly can't feel. And so you would crush a finger or cut yourself and not even realize it. And leprosy was highly, highly contagious. But Jesus healed the guy from leprosy. Uh, sometimes Jesus even healed without being there. There was somebody uh, in chapter eight who came to Jesus and said, listen, back home, I have some illness. Jesus said, because of your faith, go back, go home. They're healed. It says in Matthew eight that Jesus healed all their sick. I, I, I don't really know how many all are, but whoever was sick, Jesus healed all of them. So he has developed this reputation. He's developed this street cred as that is who he is. That is what he does. Jesus heals. And now all of a sudden he's come home to Capernaum and everybody wants to see it. It's not like Jesus could go, go live on Facebook and everybody could see what's going on with him. The only way you did that was to go where he was. These people, they wanted to go. They wanted to hear the stories. They wanted to see him do some miraculous thing that he's been doing and all the things that they've heard. They wanted to get a vision of it. So the house was full. So when these guys try to get there with their paralyzed friend, they can't get in. They knew that this is where they needed to be. They knew that this is the Jesus they've heard all these stories about. That if we can just get our buddy, and paralyzed though he may be, we bring it to Jesus, he can fix it. He will do what only he can do if we get him there. But the house is full. So they go up on the roof. And that, of course, the, the roof's then, the, the top of the house, it was made of clay and wood and, and dirt and stone and all sorts of stuff. It's tough, but we can do the work and we can make a hole big enough so we can get our buddy down in front of Jesus. That's what we got to do. So they put in the time, the work, the effort. They get him to Jesus. Mission accomplished. But let's go back and look at verse 5 again. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I have to imagine those four guys... <laughs> They're probably a little bit confused, frustrated, maybe, maybe angry, uh, doubting. They knew that this was the Jesus who heals. They knew he was right there in front of him. Jesus could do it. We've lowered our friend down, and this is our result. And I think we struggle in a similar way. We know Jesus loves us. We know our God is able to do it. We pray, we petition, we, we take things to him, but then we don't see the healing. And that takes us to the first limit that's within our control. We limit God's timing. And, and full transparency, I, 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 don't, I don't have all this figured out. I, I don't understand why it is that sometimes God heals and, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes there's miraculous things that occur that are amazing that point to him. And sometimes there's not the miraculous thing that could happen. I, I don't completely understand that. But the one thing that I do know is that God loves us. And God alone can perform miraculous healings to our bodies, to our hearts, and to our minds. But we, we have this thing where we limit God's timing. You see, we expect that we're going to see it when we think we're going to see it. We've done the steps. We stack the dominoes in the right way. And we say, okay, the next thing that happens is God does something incredible because I know he can. But sometimes that doesn't happen. I like the words from singer, songwriter, uh, Christian musician, Stephen Curtis Chapman. He says, God is God and I am not. I can only see a part of the picture that he's painting. God is God and I am man. So I'll never understand it all because only God is God. There is something that God is painting. There's something that God is doing. We see a small sliver of what's in front of us. But God is bigger than what it is we can see. So our part within that, our part within this, this, this challenge that we have is to keep the faith. Even when we don't see it, we bring it to Jesus. Even when it is that he seems silent, even when there's this expectation, this hope that we have that seems as if he's staying quiet on us, we trust in him and follow as he leads. Because as you all well know, the reality is sometimes that earthly healing, it doesn't come. We trust, we pray, we fast, but it doesn't happen. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. I think of the five-year-old in our community a, a couple years ago. Many of you, you know uh, the Draheim family. She died from brain cancer. 
I work with her dad, and, and, I, and I know I, I was even a part of our church at different times was too. We were praying for this little girl. I know the family, they, they fasted, they petitioned, they laid it at God's feet. And very, very sadly, of course, she succumbed to the cancer. It was heartbreaking. Some of you have had that same experience in your own life where there's been illness that you knew God could take care of, you brought it to him, and it didn't happen. As gut-wrenching as it probably was, I, I think that the father kind of had a, a similar reflection to what we see in Daniel 3. He, before I, we get to the scripture, he told me one day at work, he said, you know what, Mr. Hill? I knew God would heal her. I really wanted it to be here on earth, but at least she's healed now. In the book of Daniel, there's three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, there's a king in the area that says, hey, you're going to bow down and you're going to worship this idol that I've set up and everybody's going to do it. And, the, and if you don't, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. You're going to give your life for it. And so in, in Daniel 3, verse 17, we see the response that they had to him. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up for us. Our God is able. He will save us. We know this. It's going to happen. But even if he doesn't, we're going to remain faithful. We're going to stay true to him. That, that's easy for us to say when things are good. That's easy for us to say here in the comfort of, of, of a nice church here in Berlin. But when you're facing the fiery furnace, when you have a child that uh, has a bad diagnosis, when you and your family, that is hard to do. But recognizing that God will save them, recognizing God will heal, even if he doesn't do it, even if the timing is not what we think it will be, Having trust and knowing him, following him, even if it's not in the timing we expect. The first thing is to, within our control, is limit God's timing. The second is limit God's ability. We're going to go back to Mark 2, starting in verse 6 for this one. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. I tell you, Jesus is such a master dealing with difficult people. It probably helps that he knew what their hearts were thinking. That's, that's, <laughs> if we could do that, we could all probably deal with each other a little better. But I love this statement that he says, which is easier? I almost wonder if there's a little like sarcasm, tongue in cheek coming from Jesus right there. What's easier, for, forgiving of sins or telling this man to get up and walk? Do y'all really understand what it is you're saying? But just to make sure they understood what it is he's able to do, just so they understand that he can back up what it is that he is saying. He does the miracle as well. Because for our God, there is nothing he can't do. He is able to do all of it, no matter how big or how small. In the Hill House for about the past year, we've been through quite a few doctor's appointments. Uh, my 15-year-old son uh, failed his hearing test at school back in the fall of last year, which led to a doctor's appointment with the primary care, led to an ENT specialist, then to the audiologist for testing, back to the ENT, because this is, of course, the carousel that we all go on. And then we finally made it to a specialist at Hopkins who performed surgery. Turns out that my son has, did have uh, holes in both of his ears. Uh, both his eardrums had holes in them that hadn't healed. And then because of fancy Latin words I can't pronounce, um, there was a growth that took place on one of his bones that had deteriorated the bone. And so they had to replace one of those tiny little ear bones with titanium in order to fix it. Surgery went great. Everything went well about a month ago. But I knew, I knew for this, uh, regardless of the pain, my son's maybe tougher than I am, but 
Oh, he may have heard that on the stream today. Um, my, my son may be tougher than I am with regard to the, to the surgery itself, but he loves soccer. And the fall is soccer season. And I knew the harder thing for him to be was going to be missing out on at least part of soccer season, not all of it. Having a little tiny bone of titanium in your hair, you kind of need to let, let that heal. So we went into this knowing that was the case, but knowing also that if we didn't do it, the, the doctor was suggesting his hearing, he may permanently lose it if we didn't act soon. So we had to. So he, he's waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and we, we reached out to the doctor and said, hey, is there any chance we could get an earlier appointment? And she knew he was a soccer player. She was even telling us when he left and he was all doped up and stuff, make sure he's not doing headers, not playing soccer. So she told us that, yeah, I don't think that it's going to help, but you can bring him in. So this past Thursday, we went up there really early. And I'm so very happy to tell you that even though she doubted it, everything looked great. He got cleared. He's able to play soccer. I'm, it's fantastic. And, and I don't mind telling you, in the grand scheme of things, compared to a, a five-year-old with cancer, compared to the illness and the miracles that are needed for some people, compared to the, just the junk that some people are going through, my son getting cleared to play soccer, I, I recognize that that's, there, there's a level of that. But to him, it was so important. We were praying uh, not long before we went to see the doctor and I was so proud as a dad with my son. He prayed and he's like, God, if you could heal my ear, I, I'd really like that. It may not happen. It's probably, we're probably gonna get bad news, but thank you, thank you that I had the surgery and I'll be able to hear. It's like, wow. I, like I say, proud dad moment there. But it was so important to him. And our God is able to do the little things and the big things. God is able to heal. He's able to do so much. You look back to the Red Sea. We look in where the Israelites are running from the Egyptians. There's no way through. There's no way they can do. God opens it up so they can make it through. We see where there's people that are literally dead. Lazarus has been in the dead. He's, they've even got him buried. Jesus shows up. He raises him from the dead. Our God is able. In Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but everything is possible with my God. Then in Ephesians 3, Paul says, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think or imagine. There is no limit to what our God can do. Last week, we shared about a student at Decatur High School, Tyler Walsh, who was hit by the motorcycle um, a little over a week ago and has been at shock trauma for about a week. Um, I'm happy to tell you all, he's been through a number of surgeries and all of them have gone successfully. Everything's been going really well for him. He's really strong. Uh, they're even in some of the tests and stuff, starting to see little bits of his personality starting to perk up and come along. And uh, it's, it's a long road, but he's making small steps of improvement. And I'll tell you this much. The doctors, the nurses, the surgeons that are working on him, they have been blessed by God by what they're able to do. As many of you know, sometimes within trauma, that kind of thing, they, they remove a part of your skull for brain swelling. His grandmother was telling me how they, they described in detail how they will take his skull off, they will freeze it, then when the swelling goes down, they'll put his skull back on his head. And if they can't do that, they'll build him one. My God has taught somebody how to do that. My God has showed somebody the skills and the gifts and the ability to do that in order for a part of the healing process. Now, on top of that, on top of some humans that are able to do, be the hands and feet of God, there is miraculous healing that is happening in his body that he keeps coming through surgeries and doing as well as he is. Praise God, he is able, even with the long road that he has ahead of him. For our final imitation, then we want to go back to verse 5. I want you to see again what happens to the paralytic. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, he didn't look at the man on the mat. He didn't look at the paralyzed man and say, son, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. He looked at their faith. And I, and I don't want to get too lost in this or too confused about it. You see, in this moment, Jesus knows his destiny. Jesus knows where it is that he is going. He knows his purpose on this earth. He knows that he is there to ultimately go to the cross for you and for me. So the faith of the friends that lower him through the roof, 
That, that's not an eternal salvation kind of situation. That, that's not what Jesus is trying to tell us here. He already knows that this man in front of him that's laying on the mat, his sins are forgiven because Jesus is going to the cross for him. And so much more importantly than this guy's legs not working and his arms not working, the priority of what he needs to know is that his sins are forgiven. That doesn't make probably a whole lot of sense to somebody laying on a mat who can't move their arms and their legs. It may not even make a whole lot of sense to the guys that lower him through the roof. Probably the reason they were so confused. Why in the world is he talking about his sins are forgiven? My goodness sakes, the guy's arms and legs don't work. Don't you think the bigger priority, Jesus, is that you would help, but you, you are the healer who's been doing all this work? And Jesus, being the great teacher that he is, instead says, your sins are forgiven. There is nothing more important in your life, even for a guy on a mat whose arms and legs don't work, to know he is forgiven. And you know, just to make sure they understood it, Jesus went ahead and healed him anyway. That long-awaited time, that ex expectation, that, that domino they were waiting to fall, it finally happened. All of this only happened, though, because some friends decided it was important. Because they put in the time and the effort to get through the crowd, to literally tear the roof off the place, to get their friend to Jesus. This final area that, of, of control that we limit is we limit God's salvation. Jesus was able to heal, but his priority was on forgiving the sins. That is what mattered most, making sure he knew his sins were forgiven. How many people don't realize this? How many of us lose sight of this? Uh, and, and not to say that it's unheard of or how, how dare we. We get consumed. We get consumed by the pain that we're going through. We get consumed by the healing that, that, that's in process. It's still trying to take place. Our hearts are broken. Our, our, our minds are so focused on what it is that, that we're dealing with right in front of us. The fact that, to use the analogy, the fact that our arms and our legs don't work. Unfortunately, because of that, we get in our heads, well, you know what? One day when I get it all together... One day, when I'm in a, one day when I'm in a better place, then we can talk about salvation. Then we can focus on the bigger picture of what God wants to do. Because I, I, I'm just so consumed with what's going on in front of me. But the truth is, all of us are broken. All of us need healing. Our hearts, our souls, they, they, they need to be mended back together. The only way that can happen is through Jesus Christ. In John 14, Jesus tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. But the good news about it, the good news about his offering, the good news about going through Jesus, you can never be too broken. There is no brokenness that you can have, no mess, no junk, no scars, no illness, no whatever that you have in your life that he can't take care of. Too often we have this idea, even there's some people that say, well, if I, if I set foot in that church, that place would come crumbling down, lightning would strike. They have this idea that they, they're, they're just too broken, too sinful, too messed up. Jesus knew when he went to the cross. He knew all the sins that had been committed, all those that were and all those that were going to be. And he went because he loves us that much. He loves us and gave of himself being broken for us, knowing full well all the things that we've done and all we're going to. So the question for us, if you've never accepted that free gift, if you've never accepted that Jesus died for you, when are you going to let him love you just for you with all your mess, all your hangups, all your scars? He's ready and waiting. Maybe you know Jesus. Maybe, in, maybe instead that you, you do have that personal relationship with him. Who in your life is paralyzed? Who, who in your life that you pass by is laying on a mat and needs to get to Jesus? 
And just as importantly, maybe yes, a physical healing, but more importantly, they, they need to know that they're forgiven. There are people that you come in contact with every single day. That they need that healing from Christ from a maternal perspective. They need their hearts mended back together for him. We live in a world that's desperate for healing. A lot of them don't even know it. They'll only know it if you tell them. <laughs>